Your love searches for the lost, makes the foulest clean, reaches even me. You love, you love, you love, you love us all the same. Hey, good morning, friends. Welcome to River Heights Vineyard. I'm Justin. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm really glad to see you. Thanks for being here. Uh, also, welcome to you if you are at home right now. I love that we have opportunities to be together in this room and also have our church family with us uh, from all over. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to welcome you if you're able to uh, stand with us as we start singing to the Lord. And let's just together, let's just welcome, let's just welcome the Lord, okay? And wherever you're at, let's just say, come, Lord Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. God, give us the ability uh, to receive from you this morning. And also, God, give us the ability to offer ourselves to you just as we are. Thank you that you welcome us. That you're so glad that uh, we're making time to be with you, God. We lift up your name, Jesus. This is all for your glory. And we're going to sing in Spanish a little bit this morning. Vengo a cantarte, vengo a cantarte, 
vuelvo a decirte que Él es mi Dios, Dios poderoso, Dios del descanso, Dios cuando rojo, y te no está.
bless your name, Lord. We lift you up. Every week we have the opportunity to have communion together. You know, like you you received the elements as you came in in the room this morning. It's a way for an excuse. It signifies Jesus' body broken for you and for me. It's bloodshed for you and for me. And there's a film on the top of it. You can remove that first. There's the wafer. Then there's another film under that. And then uh, the juice is under that. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. And bless you as you take the elements.
Lord, we thank you for your presence here among us. Jesus, we lift up your name. So wonderful to worship with you together, friends. Uh, you can be seated for now, and Jeff has announcements for us. Morning, Jeff. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. That was good. And how about you at home? Good to see you this morning. Elbow bumps all Sunday long. How are we doing today, guys? Doing all right? Sweet. That's good. That's good. Hey, just want to welcome everybody. It's a great Sunday to be here. Uh, can't wait to have you guys here with us on Sunday as well. So we look forward to meeting here as an entire family, but it is good to have part of our family here. But we are family, whether we're here or on a screen. We are all still family. So looking forward to that day. Uh, if you're a guest with us, it is so great to have you joining us today. We would love to meet you, get to know you a little bit more. After the service in our Welcome Center, go straight through the doors just to the right there. We have a special gift for you, so make sure you check that out on your way out today. Um, also, our purpose here at River Heights Vineyard Church, we say it every week, but it's important. Uh, it's very important because it's what we do and who we are. But we want to help a growing number of people love God, love people, and change the world. And that is our goal. That is our hope. That is what we want to do. And it's being done. Even in the last few months uh, under quarantine and all these things, our church family, you guys have been amazing in your giving and supporting that purpose statement um, because we can't do some of the things without that. So we're excited about that. Thank you so much. Um, you can still give. Push pay. Uh, go online and give on PushPay, or you can go, there's two boxes on your way out. You can drop an envelope in there um, on your way out today as well. So we look forward to that. In your programs is a connection card. Make sure you fill that out today. Whether you're a member, fill that out, uh, regular attender. If you're a guest, you can fill out as much information as you feel comfortable doing, but that's kind of how we get to know you a little bit as a staff, because sometimes we get busy, don't get to talk to you much. But one important thing on that for everyone is prayer requests. So if you're online, make sure that you are filling out the connection card online with a prayer request. Uh, we want to pray for you. We as a staff, we get to do that every week. Um, and I don't care how big or small you think it is, put it on there and drop it off because we are praying for you as a staff. And we love doing that. So make sure you do that, please. Now, a huge couple things that are happening, something very big is our Vacation Bible School, which our amazing Becca has, uh, our, she's our children's and youth pastor. She has put together what's called Staycation, because people are staying home. If you want to, there we have some backyards. People have donated, well, I shouldn't say donated, opened up their backyards to kids, which is awesome. That's what Stay Staycation Bible School is going to be. It's going to be in people's backyards um, August 3rd through the 5th. The thing about it, too, is that it's not just in backyards, but it's also online. So it's a double whammy. And if you were here last week, you saw a video with uh, the online small group leader is Sue Marsden. Hello. So that's awesome. Now, if you have kids or if you know of kids that want to be a part of this, make sure they sign up and register online at riverheightsvineyard.org, either in person or online for virtual VBS, so, or Staycation Bible School. So make sure, sign up for that, or get the information out, August 3rd through the 5th. Now, secondly, Belong is, another, is a class, it's part of our membership class, but it's really a class that we get to, you get to know River Heights a little bit, get to know some of the staff members, but also it's how we serve the community, how we get to serve each other, um, generosity, and kind of some membership stuff, but it's a great class, so you get to even know some people. I was in uh, the last one, uh, the Belong class. That was, or not Belong, what's it called? Thank you. Connect. I just went to it last week. Hello, I'll wake up. Um, but the Connect class, it was great. Got to meet some people like Justin and Krista and some other people. So it was great to meet people. Uh, it's a great place to be. So that's happening August 9th from 1.30 to 4.30. Make sure you sign up for that. So you got a little time for that, all right? Now let's pray, and then Pete will come and share the word today. Holy Spirit, would you come? Thank you for Justin and the team leading us in worship this morning. So Lord, we want to continue our worship, not just in music, but in word as well. So Lord, Holy Spirit, come speak to us. 
Open up our minds to what you have to us. May we experience you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. It is so nice to see you all. My name is Pete. I am one of the pastors here. And I'm going to get to page one in a second here. Then I'm going to know what I'm saying. I got it all written out. Um, yeah, I know how I like to open. I'm so glad we can be together, and at the same time, we have so many people who can't be together with us. I just want to lead us in a prayer every week um, so that we can bless those who can't be with us. So God, we're so grateful, uh, first of all, for your gifts in Christ, in one another, and in all our family who's here and not here. And we ask, God, that you would send your Holy Spirit right now here and with all who are listening. And we ask also, God, that you would bring us rescue, that soon we would be able to be together and safe and secure at the same time. Amen. All right, this week we are kicking off a new sermon series that is called The Good and Beautiful Life. It's the next step in a series that we started some months ago. At the heart of this series is the idea that taking on the narrative of Jesus, living our lives out of Jesus' stories and teachings instead of out of the story the world has put on us, we can find a life that is genuinely good and beautiful right here in this fairly screwed up and broken world. And this story matches a ton of my life. So my life was miserable for the longest time. I was depressed and fantasized about suicide, starting at age 9, lasting until I was 23. I spent several years wearing only black, my whole closet black all the way down. And I was so cheesy, I would tell people, I wear black on the outside because that's how I feel on the inside, right? I was a goth cliche, but the pain in my heart wasn't just for show. It was overwhelming and it was literally killing me. I believed I was bad. I believed no one could or would love me. I believed I would always be ultimately alone. I lived constantly with that sense of being in a crowd and feeling rejected and alone at the same time. And I held on to my life story pretty fiercely. If people wanted to argue about the meaning of life or what's right or wrong, I was always ready to go for it as long as anyone wanted. And if people challenged my story, I did not back down. I was miserable. And at the same time, I defended everything that I thought was right. Now, I wasn't all bad. No one is. There were things I stood for then that I'm proud of. I worked for years in a group home for the disabled, and I loved my residents, and I missed them. And when a president vetoed a civil rights bill, I changed my registration that day. There were like some moments of light in the darkness. I did have enough good in me that there were people who loved me, but my story about life didn't allow me to see that at the time. My story was killing me. Now, my story began to change the night God saved my life. I had been failing for years. Drug addiction feels like constant failure. You wake up and you know you're a slave and you try to quit and you can't. Lather, rinse, repeat again and again. And so my despair grew from a self-righteous pain that I blamed on other people to a self-loathing pain that I blamed myself for, that I couldn't do any better. And in the middle of that, God saved me. On the worst day of my life, right at the peak of my addiction, my ex-wife walked out on me and I decided to end my life. And instead, God showed up and God held me through the night. And when I woke up, I never wanted to be high again and I wanted to live. Now, over the years since then, a whole lot has changed about my life. God led me through what I'd now call the 12 steps, although I didn't know what they were at the time. The 12 steps are a spiritual program of recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous and all the other anonymouses that are out there. And if you've never worked the 12 steps, I think they're the best discipleship tool in the world. And we have Celebrate Recovery here on Tuesdays, where we work the 12 steps together to find freedom from hurts, habits, and hangups. And you are totally invited because you have hurts, habits, and hangups, don't you? Amen? Amen. 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 Celebrate Recovery summarizes steps eight and nine with this principle. We evaluate all our relationships, offering forgiveness to those who have harmed us and making amends for wrong we've done, except when to do so would harm ourselves or others. It was so significant to me that God walked me through prayers of forgiveness while I was coming clean. I prayed forgiveness for myself. I prayed forgiveness for all kinds of other people. I asked 
God to forgive all Christians. I ask God to forgive all Americans. I ask for God to forgive everyone in the world. I would walk because I gave up my car in the divorce. I gave my wife the assets. I took all the debts because I was a moron. And uh, as I was walking to work and back, I would just have these painful things that I had done in my life come up, and I would feel so bad, and they would always come up in my head, you know? I had rehearsed them for years. And then I would just start praying, and eventually I would feel like, hey, that's why Jesus came, is to, like, forgive you. And I would feel like something lifted off of me. And I don't know, I was only 23, but I had a lot of stuff to lift off of me. (laughs) And so it just happened for weeks and weeks. And um, as I prayed, I experienced forgiveness. I experienced God saying, you know, that's what I came for. I want to take that off of you. And nowadays when I close my eyes, that's not what I see every time is all the wrong things that I've done. God forgave me even when I didn't know what was going on. And he forgave me before I did anything to earn it. God also brought me to the Bible, which has been at the center of our preaching in this series, and always will be. And the Bible had this new power in my life to change my story, right? If you're using the Bible to tell you how right you are, you are using that thing wrong. (laughs) I discovered that the Bible can change me. I started to live differently. I figured I'd share one small example. I read Jesus says to love your enemies. And I used to love fighting. I did a bunch of, you know, kickboxing and martial arts. And I was a tiny kid, so when I got to a new school, which happened a few times, I'd find a big, slow kid and start a fight with them, and then nobody would mess with me after that, right? (laughs) And I read, Jesus says, love your enemies. And I decided, you know what? That's beautiful. That's better than anything I've tried. I'm going to try to do that. That got put to the test a couple times. It really sucks to let someone hit you. (laughs) But because of Jesus, I could hold on. And because of Jesus, I didn't wind up with new things I regret, you know? These small things started to add up, and I grew from a self-hating, depressed addict, divorced and friendless, into a genuinely joyful follower of Jesus who is still broken in places, but who has been transformed. My story is not how the world did me wrong anymore. My story is that God has done right by me. My story is not that I'm unworthy of love and filled with self-hatred. My story is Jesus loves me, this I know, for not only did the Bible tell me so, but it's been proven out in my life as God changed me and my story. And I have seen this happen for so many people through the years. So many of my friends and my family and my recovery community and my church family have experienced God's power to change our story as we let God into our lives. Has God ever changed your story? Hands up if God has changed your story. Look at all the hands in this room. That's a lot of God moving. Now, if God hasn't changed your story yet, that's okay. We got plenty of room for you. I love you, friends. Go with God. We'll see you soon. Sweet. Fantastic. I look forward to it. Um, You know, we believe in a God who will change your story eventually. And we believe you can totally belong before any of these things happen. It might happen today. Who knows? Change is going to come. How might God change our stories again today? Let's open our hearts right now for God to speak through his word. We're going to turn to Matthew 7, verse 24. This is Jesus, and he says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds their house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and then doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come, the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus was finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. Now, I learned a song about this passage as a kid. The wise man built his house upon the rock, his house upon the rock, his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down, the floods came up, the rains came down, the floods came up. The house on the rock stood firm. I love that my story includes people teaching me about Jesus before I was old enough to understand. I pity the children's workers who were teaching me. 
I was a crazy handful as a kid, but I'm so grateful my story included good things of God that I didn't even know or see. Now, this passage here comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And many people, myself included, would call this the central teachings of Christ, the core of what it means to be a Christian. And in these chapters, Jesus challenges us to do crazy things, like live free of anger forever, live free of lust in every way, love your friends and your enemies. Matthew 5 through 7 is my favorite Bible passage. It's beautiful, it's inspiring, and it's impossible without God's supernatural power. When I consider my life and the world and the ways that both of them are broken, I'm so moved and even hopeful about what God calls us to in these verses. And at the end, which is where our passage comes, at the end of the greatest sermon ever written, Jesus says, if you want to survive the storms of life, don't just listen to Jesus put his plan into action. The Bible puts it this way in another passage. If you hear God's ways and don't do them, you're like someone who looks in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what you look like. I really like this analogy. God knows us all the way down. God created you. He knows what you're here for and why, and he loves you. When you look into God's ways, you will know yourself better than any other time in the world. And when you go live them out, you become who you're meant to be. When God gives you an invitation to change your life, it's always for your good, for others' good, and for the good of the world. God's commands are built on God's desire to love and be loved with you forever. And so when we put his commands into practices, that's how we know ourselves so much more deeply than we could know ourselves without doing these things. Now, there's two people in today's passage. There's a wise man and another one. The person who hears Jesus' teaching and puts it into practice survives the storms and floods of life. How many people know the storms and floods are coming? Amen? You do not have to be a weatherman to know this. Like it's somewhere on the radar. It might be far away. You might be right in the middle of it. You might be in the eye having a brief rest in the middle of it, right? There's also a person in this story who hears and then walks away from God's call. And that person's building their house on stand. The stories I told myself about life until I was 23 felt so solid to me. But a little drug addiction and divorce blew it all right down. And the crash was mighty. Now, ironically, people, and you and me are included in this, are terrible at knowing ourselves. This is a very well-established research truth that goes deeper than you think it does. We have a group here called Leadership Pub. We read a book every three months. We get together at a bar and talk about it. And one of my favorite books we've read is Stumbling on Happiness. And the book has one idea. The whole book's about this. You are terrible at knowing what would make you happy. You're awful at it. You're worse than anyone else in the room is, literally. The author opens the book by sharing this, and then that's all the book is about for 95% of the book. And he says, you know what, at the end, I'll tell you what actually works, but because of human nature, you won't do it, right? And so for 95% of this book, study after study details how our biases and our brain, the way it functions, mean we are slightly worse than a random guess at figuring out what would make us happy. And in the final chapter, he shares what works. Find someone who's happy and ask them what made them happy. Don't ask for their ideas about happiness because they're as dumb as you are, right? Ask them what happened that made them happy. The research shows that works. It's not magic, but it helps. I read this with a whole bunch of people, and at the end I said, you know what, I'm super happy. And I was thinking someone's totally going to ask me what made me happy. Not one person (laughs) asked what made me happy. You You know what? I am super deeply happy, and here's what worked for me. Love and serve God. Give your life to Jesus. Learn slowly over time to follow the voice of God in your everyday life. 
It has completely worked for me. I've seen it work for a ton of other people. If you are here today and you have followed Jesus and it has made you happier, would you stick your hand up in the air? Yeah. Now, you know what's funny is how many of us still think something else will make us happy, right? <laughs> All of us, myself included. I very frequently think a new computer would make a big difference right now. <laughs> You know what? And it literally never has. It's, it's made some difference, but not the one I'm looking for. You know, I'm a little poorer and a little more of my time goes into that thing, but that's not what's going to work, right? Now, if this was the end of my message, I'd actually be unhappy because if you just read about two guys building houses, you end up with the idea that having a better life depends entirely on you. And if that was the case, the life of faith would be us working hard at doing the right thing so that things would go well for us. And I don't mind telling you, working hard to do the right thing often has good results. But it is definitely not what the Christian faith is about. Our faith is not that if we do the right thing, we get what we deserve. Thank goodness. Our faith is in Jesus, and he has already done all the right things. The Son of God left heaven to be with us because God loves us as we are. And Jesus lived and loved here because God wants to be with you. Jesus did what was right for all time, for his whole life, including things like criticizing the wealthy and powerful and religious leaders, which when you're doing miracles and so everyone believes your criticism, very threatening to humanity. And so humanity wasn't going to stand for it and put him to death horribly. But that did not stop the power of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And this is where our hope lies. Christian hope is centered in the resurrected Jesus who is alive in heaven right now. Our hope is not that our work will save us. It's that the work of Jesus Christ already has. Matthew 7 is a great story about two builders, but without verses 28 and 29, it's just telling us to work harder. But let's look at the last two verses from today's passage again. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. And so the teachers of religious law will tell you all day what you have to do, right? If they're good teachers of religious law, they might tell you why. Only Jesus can teach with the authority to make it happen. The hope of our faith is that not only is Jesus going to teach us a good way to live, but Jesus has the authority to help us do it. The most important part of my story of faith isn't changes I've made over time. It is changes God made in me. My sobriety was a gift of the power of God that came from nothing I contributed. My freedom from depression and suicide happened when I was baptized, and that's not why I showed up. Time and again, God has met me in my life and through the Holy Spirit brought the power of God for change into me. The key to the Christian life isn't you working harder, it's God working in you. The Apostle Paul writes, I am confident that God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases God. And so our hope and the message today isn't that we can work harder. Our hope and the message today is that God works in us. The heart of our series is Jesus' invitation to experience a good and beautiful life, and we're not going to get there by magically gutting out some formula. If we could, we would have figured it out and sold it, right? And we'd be doing really well. <laughs> God loves you. It's God who has the power to get you there one step, one day at a time, with ups and downs, but over time, God's going to get us all there. The way of Jesus, which is beautiful and inspiring and impossible by ourselves, is made possible by God. Now, I'm still broken today. I am still struggling like all of us are, variously with selfishness or anger or impatience, depending on the day, you know. But when I look backward, I see that through all the challenges inside and outside, God has walked with me. God has many times carried me. God has changed me. And so each week in this series, we're going to offer you a kind of soul training. 
The soul training is designed to put you in a place where you can meet God and experience God's love and power. It's not the soul training that's going to change your life. It's God showing up in the soul training that's going to change your life. That's where transformation happens. As a bonus, the soul training usually feels awesome, kind of like a gift when you're done. This week's soul training is to revisit the 1900s and do something we haven't done in a long time. We're going to write a letter. That's like an email with pen and paper, all right? Here is the soul training for this week. Write a letter to God. You don't even have to mail it. Start the letter with, Dear God, the life I want most for myself is. Like God actually made and loves you and cares about the desires of your heart. God wants to know what you need. There's a Bible verse we'll get to that says that. And then finish the letter with, God, I am thankful for, right? When I was in my early 20s and dying and miserable, never would have occurred to me to be thankful for someone teaching me a children's song about rocks and sand, you know? I'm thankful now. How kind of those people. I mean, they were skipping the adult service to hang out with me. Wow. How kind. God bless you who do that. God bless you. Now, you're going to be tempted like me to think, ooh, that might work. Hey, yeah, that might be cool. You know what? I realize it's cool, so I'm not going to do it. You know, I should probably just like, you know, benefit from thinking about it instead of writing a letter. It's always tempting to keep building our house our own way. Inertia is a very powerful thing. Justin, you can come on up. Worship team, you can come on back up. My challenge to you today is to do this. Let God know your heart's desires. And you know what? Because you don't know yourself that well, you might discover some things while you're writing. God wants to be in a relationship with you for the rest of your life. And here's what Philippians 2 says about this. If you want to stop worrying and know the peace of God, tell God what you need and thank Him for what He's done. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. That's the Bible, right? And so our exercise today is about doing something the Bible invites us to do so that we can experience something that the Bible says God will bring. And so take the time, sit down, write the desires of your heart, and write what you're thankful for. And may God's peace visit you and be a part of your way and your day as you do so. I want to encourage you to buy the book for this series, The Good and Beautiful Life, is available in our bookstore, and it's pretty great to read the chapters and read the soul training. It's pretty great to do it in a family of Christians where other people are doing it too. Um, it's available less expensive electronically if you have an e-reader or a tablet. We're going to spend some good weeks experiencing God's presence this way, pressing on into a good and beautiful life. Amen? I encourage you guys to show up. I'm going to miss next week because I'm turning 50 on Saturday. And I feel super great about hitting my 50s. I'm ready to leave the 40s behind and do better, right? I'm ready for an awesome, my, my life goal, every decade better than the one before it. I ran into a happy guy when I was 19, and he said, every decade gets better if you do it right. And I said, I'm going to do that right? And so I got a great decade coming up, you know? Um, in two weeks, I met this guy at the Festival of Homiletics. That's a literal festival of preaching where you pay 700 bucks to have someone preach at you for eight hours a day. It's mind-blowingly weird, as you might expect. And um, this one guy preached there, and he blew my mind. And he preached the first sermon I've ever heard and thought, that could be preached in my sermon exactly as it was. I've never felt that way before. And uh, getting to know him led me to go to seminary where he has designed the program and is one of my professors. He's going to come preach in two weeks. I'm super excited to have him come here. Rolf is one of the most joyful, sassy, humorous guys. Literally on every test, if you make something funny, you get two points. Uh, right? In, in every paper. Uh, can't wait to see how that goes. I'll see you. I'll see you in two weeks. Um, I want to invite you to stand right now. 
And I just want to lead us in prayer as we transition into worship. You know, we close with prayer and worship because those are the most important things we're doing when we get together on a Sunday. Amen. And so um, let me just kick off the prayer part by praying for you. You know, God, would you just come and give us your power? Many of us are tired from doing the right thing. Many of us are worn. Many of us are broken inside, God. And we just need your help. We just need you to show up, God. We ask that you would speak with your authority into our hearts and lives. Jesus, would you speak your word again into us? Would you release us to trust you enough to share our heart's desires with you? Would you receive our gratitude today for all the good things you've put in us along the way? And would you send your peace, our peace that passes understanding, receive the peace of God? Love you, God. Receive our worship and our gratitude. If you're visiting, uh, I'd love to meet with you in the Welcome Center today. The worship team will let us know when the service is over. God bless you, friends.
we ask for bread that you give us the your friends to receive everything that the Lord has for you right now. Bless you to experience deeper relationship with, with Jesus today and this week ahead. God, uh, we invite you to move in our lives today, to move in our lives this week. Thank you for what you're building within us. That's your building through us as a church family. Glorify your name through our lives, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness.
wonderful to be together with you.